thank you, Mona, for doing this. I appreciate it. And I'm just going to ask you a few questions about your life as an activist, kind of. Can you, first of all, tell me what events or beliefs in your youth maybe led you to become an activist? Uh, thank you, Connie. Um, it's great to talk with you and it's, it's great to be part of this, um, this little video. So that is a great question and I think I need hours to answer it. Um, so, you know, um, after having writing a book, after having written a book, uh, which is very much a memoir, I've asked myself that question a lot. Like, how did I become who I am today? Like, what was it in my childhood and my family history that really put me in a position um, to speak truth to power. And, you know, I think there's many things, um, but I think it very much um, starts with the milieu of my childhood. Um, so I am an immigrant. We came to this country when I was four. We're Iraqi American. Um, we came here for what all immigrants come here for, which is kind of freedom and justice and democracy, um, leaving a place where that was rising in tyranny and fascism and dictatorship. Um, so when and when I, when I was growing up, my parents never shielded me from the injustices that was happening um, back in our home country. Um, and they instilled in me the belief that no matter where you are, you have a role to play in fighting for justice. Uh, I think I'm just going to kind of share a couple examples that I think really kind of solidified that in, in my upbringing. Um, one was a story that was always shared to me about my great uncle Nuri. Um, so my great uncle Nuri was the, kind of this radical, um, my mom would even say he even had a tattoo. I'm like, oh my God, he had a tattoo. Um, but he was always kind of um, on the run, um, fleeing from authorities, but always fighting for what was right. Um, he, well, um, he created an organization in Iraq in the 1930s called the Association Against Imperialism and Fascism. Like, how cool is that? Like, I would sign up and be part of that group right now. Um, he went to Palestine to fight for Palestine's independence against British rule. And then he found his way as one of two Iraqis in Spain in the Spanish Civil War as part of the International Brigades. And because he had spent some time at MIT, he was actually lumped with the Americans in the Abraham Lincoln brigades. Um, so here I was growing up hearing about my great uncle Nuri, who you know took risks, uh, who was not fighting for country or religion or race, but really for something that was bigger because it was the right thing to do. Uh, so that is one of kind of the memories and, and the kind of family history, oral history that was passed on to me um, that kind of shaped who I am. Um, another really kind of defining moment in, in I think my childhood was um, an encounter I had with my father when I was like 10 or 11 years old. So my dad was uh, always trying to find out about what was happening back home in Iraq. He, we had, you know, throughout his office, he had, you know, Amnesty International, you know, subscriptions, magazines, and Human Rights Watch, trying to get any news about what's happening in Iraq. And I remember one day going into his back office and he shared with me um, an image of a child, a baby, um, on the ground with, um, with his father, both of them deceased. And he shared what had happened in Iraq, um, in northern Iraq, uh, the massacre at Halabja, where Saddam Hussein literally poisoned an entire village of Kurds. Uh, it was the largest, it is the largest chemical weapons attack to date. About 5,000 people died that day. And that image was seared um, in, inside my head. I had nightmares kind of forever. Um, and it, it taught me um, what people in power can do to vulnerable populations. And that I couldn't stand in the sidelines, that it was part of kind of who I was and where I came from um, to, to make the world a better place. Thank you for sharing the stories of how that started in you, because it clearly is still very much alive. Um, so I'm curious, what continues to motivate you to be an activist? What things give you courage and guide you? Oh, I love that question. Um, undoubtedly, it is children. Um, so as a pediatrician, uh, I have the best job in the world, I think. I have this amazing privilege of hanging out with the most brilliant kids. Um, our children in Flint, but really children everywhere um, are brave and they are resilient and they are strong and they are smart um, and they are change makers. And when I have that everyday opportunity as a pediatrician to hang out with our children, um, it, it is like a recharge. It inspires me to keep going. It inspires me to 
to really do my part. And I said, you know, I mentioned earlier that like, you know, as, as a, as a physician, um, so as a pediatrician, I've, you know, I've literally taken an oath to stand up and protect kids and people are like, oh, you did all this because it was your professional duty. I'm like, no, I did all this because it was my human duty. So like oath or not, doctor or not, like it is, it is our job, whoever we are, wherever we are, whatever we do um, to stand up and, and fight and be inspired by, especially on behalf of our children. Thanks. As a lifelong educator, I totally agree with you. I get it. Yeah, there's um, no, we, we, we do the same work. So my mom was a teacher. My grandma was a teacher. Teachers and pediatricians, we are in the same business. You know, it is not as much about the kid in front of us, but about the potential of our children. Uh, so, you know, we, we are in solidarity. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, and finally, so what advice do you have for youth activists? Yeah, so I think the question is probably reversed. Like I, you know, they need to be given us advice because if you look at the if you look at the movements that are happening right now, be it from climate change or gun control, um, or you know, you name it, it is being led by our youth. Um, they are creating more change and inspiring more folks than than so many of us older folks. Uh, so you know, I, the example that is most kind of personal to me is we have a little girl in Flint. Her name is um, Mari Copany. She also goes by Little Miss Flint. She's 12 years old now. When she was eight, she wrote a letter to President Obama that brought him to Flint. Uh, she has done more and raised more awareness and raised more money um, for kind of national issues, global issues of environmental injustice and water quality than most adults. Um, so I, you know, what I would kind of um, advise uh, is for adults to take, to, to listen, to close our mouths and to, and to really put kids, you know, give them a seat at the table. Uh, we need to do a better job listening to our children and being kind of guided um, by their hopes and their dreams. Thank you so much. That was great, great advice. Thanks.